Hey everybody, at home at Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. Hope everyone's doing well today. Look what I've got here. I've got a Rogue Audio Faro 2 integrated amplifier. It's pretty remarkable. Sit back, relax, and we're going to talk about this cool hybrid amp. All the old guys hi-fi whispering in the night Bridging past and pressing in the glow of autumn light He holds the future gently like he held the past so tight In the old guy's hi-fi Everything feels right So what is the Rogue Faro 2? Well, it's a hybrid tube integrated amplifier, and it's really, really interesting. And I'd like to big shout out to Mike Holm and Holm Audio here in Chicago, our high-end uh, audio retailer in the western suburbs located in Woodridge, Illinois. Mike was kind enough to loan this to me for review, and shout out to them. There will be a link to their webpage in the description. I have no affiliation with them, but if you want to visit their webpage and see the products they carry, and they carry a great selection of very good, very high-end stuff. So big shout out to Holm Audio for that. So the Ferro 2 is actually a hybrid tube Class D integrated amplifier, and it's very, very compelling. We're going to talk about some of the technologies of it because it's really interesting. So it does use 12 AU7 tubes in what's called a mu follower preamp inside, and it is Hypex Encore Class D output stage. Very, very interesting. Very full feature. It's got a great set of goes into and goes out as, and we'll look at it on the back. And looking at the front cover, it isn't the most beautiful thing in the world, but sonically, it really is. And we're going to talk about that later. This is the, sorry, this is the infrared receiver for the giant remote control, which only does volume up and down and mute. This is input selector from phono through balanced in three inputs. And again, you'll see them on the back. This is the processor loop. It has a loop through, not pre-out main in, but a loop through that you can initiate if you want to put an EQ or some sort of processor in it, push the button and all your input sources are then run through the processor and then into the amp and then out to your speakers. Big volume control, unity gain button. There's a separate jack on the back for unity gain. You can push that and take whatever input sources and it just runs straight to the amplifier. It does not run through the preamp. Then balance control and then the initiate the headphone amplifier, which is amazing. It's tube driven. It's got MOSFETs in it. I tried it with a pair of uh, FIO FT5 planar magnetic headphones and it sounded really good. Very, very good. So anyway, that's the Rogue 2. Uh, excuse me, the Faro 2. We're going to spin it around, look at the back. We're going to take it over to the workbench, open it up. And then we're, after that, I'm going to tell you what I think of how it sounds. Well, here we are looking at the back panel of the Faro 2. We've got phono ground, phono input, uh, speaker, right speaker output, left speaker output, and then all our goes into and goes out is. So we have variable output, which you can take and feed out to a uh, subwoofer. We have a fixed output if you wanted to run out to a recording device. This is the processor loop where you can put in an EQ or any other kind of processor you might want to. And you got line one, line two, line three, the unity gain input. Right, so there's nothing going through the preamplifier, and then your balanced inputs as well. IEC power socket, a fuse, and master power switch. When they recommend leaving it powered up all the time um, in standby mode, so it's kind of ready to go. So anyway, that's the back panel of the Faro 2. Let's take open it up and look inside. So here we are looking at the inside of the Rogue Ferro 2. Now the Ferro 2 is designed around Hypex Encore amplifier modules, obviously for increased power and performance, but it also includes some upgrades. The preamplifier includes a new phono preamp section, and I'll insert a photo. There are some dip switches and a moving magnet, moving coil switch, so you can configure it to your own use, and I did try it, and it is quite good. It also includes an upgraded hybrid headphone amplifier, which uses not only tubes, but MOSFETs, and I did try that and it sounded really good. So the interesting thing about this is the preamplifier use what's, uses what's called a mu follower circuit topology. Now mu follower, in the, in the mu follower circuit design, these long plate 12 AU7s are used because of their sonic characteristics. They have really, they have enhanced detail and a richer harmonic profile compared to the short plate version. And I'll insert some pictures on it. These are triode tubes. So there's three sections to each tube. So Obviously, the long plate refers to a version of the tube that has a longer internal plates, which typically provide a richer, fuller sound and a wider frequency response compared to shorter plates. However, there are some drawbacks to long plates. They can be more microphonic. Tubes can pick up vibrations, and you can hear that sometimes if you tap them. So mu follower, mu follower 
circuit topology is a two-stage circuit where the bottom portion of the tube, remember there's three sections in each one of these tubes, the bottom portion of the tube is, uh, works as an amplifying stage and the top section of the tube acts as a current source. So the bottom portion of the triode amplifies the input signal while the top section of the tube provides high impedance. That improves gain, linearity, um, and obviously uh, makes the stage more powerful to drive uh, other things further down the line. So the idea is the top tube, the current source, follows the bottom tube's voltage, hence the name mu follower. And I know mu is a Greek letter and it has a meaning something else. So inside there is obviously a bottom plate, top plate, and then there's all the plates that uh, that transfer all the electrons out from one to the other so they can do its job. So the configuration like this, a mu follower, uh, minimizes the signal gain without adding any significant distortion. And obviously with the long plate 12AU7s, they add some tonal richness and everything else. So the whole idea behind mu follower circuit is to reduce distortion and provide a smoother, fuller sound. Also too, mu follower exhibits lower output impedance which can be really beneficial in driving subsequent stages within the amplifier, obviously in additional loads. So it does give you an enhanced sound stage and depth. Obviously these, these have a very, very rich character and you get a more detailed and more dynamic sound presentation. So it's really, really interesting. So again, I'll insert some close-up pictures of the tubes if I haven't done that already. Um, I will insert a close-up picture of the phono preamp if I haven't done that already. And on the power supply, just real quick to talk uh, to discuss that huge toroidal transformer for the amplifier circuit, large toroidal transformer for the rest of the circuitry, and then obviously our power caps, filter caps. Now remember that in a class D amplifier, the cap, the capacitance, the amount of capacitance is these are 6,800 microfarads each and these are 680. Is it, it, the requirements are different for class D than they would be for class A or class AB where you typically have ginormous huge power uh, uh, filtering capacitors in the power supply. This is more than adequate for the end core. Obviously each end core module has a bunch of capacitance on it, but the way they operate is different than class AB. So obviously it has a different layout, different look. Anyway, that's looking at it, the inside of the Rogue Ferro 2. I'm gonna button it back up. We're gonna go in the studio. We're gonna talk about how it sounds. Well, as you can see from looking inside, this is a very well engineered, very well constructed, very well thought out, elegantly designed hybrid amplifier. And I think that whole long play 12AU7 mu follower preamp circuit is just really, really cool. And it lends and imparts a sonic character to this that is I think unique. It's certainly unique to me because again, this is my first kind of deep dive into a hybrid tube front end, uh, class D back end amplifier of any kind. So how did I test it? Well, I used all the usual suspects. I used my big wharf tails. I used the ELAC DBR62 stand mount speakers. I used my energy reference speakers, but primarily I used the Neil Blanchard design MLTL6 stand mount transmission line speakers, and they're really remarkable, quite good. Um, from sources, I fed it analog source, TIAC was kind enough to send me a TN3B turntable, and I did use the phono preamp in this on both moving magnet and moving coil, and it is quite good. Excellent phono stage in this. I'm not sure you'd need to add a phono stage if you're big into analog, it's really that good. Um, Digital sources were fed from either Artivana or from the Cambridge MXN10 streamer just as a digital transport. And I used primarily, I used the live Harmony DAC on this running I squared S. Um, and that was a very good combination. I did use my shit Bifrost and I did use the DeShelly Daisy DAC, um, again, running through a DDC on optical for that. So all those digital sources. Uh, and I did use a Rotel DT6000, which is a transport DAC in one box. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, anyway, so all those sources and everything. So what did I listen to? Well, I've had this for a while. And again, this is the first opportunity I've had to kind of do a deep dive into the tube front class D back uh, amplifier stuff. And so I listened to a lot of stuff. And the sonic characteristic of this is you can dive in and listen for hours and there's no fatigue at all. It's just, mm, we'll talk about that in a minute. So recordings, I use this recording from a Agnes Obel called Aventine. Her voice is quite remarkable. Um, it's a really interesting album in that it's got a little bit of classical feel to it. It's got just a little bit of acoustic kind of folk feel, feel to it. Um, she's a Danish born singer. I think she uh, lives in Berlin. 
just an interesting, really interesting voice. Um, I think there is some processing going on, but still, I you can't. I don't think you can mask a really good voice, even with processing. But I think it's just lightly applied. Her voice is just remarkable. Very, very good. Very interesting to listen to. And I'll talk about, you know, in that range of her voice, how this thing performed. But just a fun, fun and interesting and kind of different uh, album for me. That's all. Um, then this one, the Haddock Trio, Utopies. This is an amazing jazz album. It's kind of a mix of jazz, a little bit of fusion, some world music, some different beats, some I did a little sense of Middle Eastern in there just all kinds of really interesting stuff. It's a French trio and man, it is remarkable. This one gets high recommendations uh, from me. This would be in the running if I was gonna do an album of the year kind of thing. And it's not the latest, their latest one, but this is just really, really fascinating and engaging. And I, I wound up going down to the rabbit hole and listen to all their stuff and then all the individual artists stuff. But this one's a standout, this uh, Utopies from Haddock Trio. Now, to get back a little more kind of on this side of the pond, um, I used this album from Junior Kimbrough called All Night Long, and this is juke joint music at its best. This is Mississippi Delta Blues. This is just so authentic. It's amazing. Now, it's recorded by Fat Possum Records, and Fat Possum Records is located in, the, in the, the, this area of Mississippi, and I don't know specifically what town, but they're famous for recording a bunch of different uh, really good blues musicians. And Junior Kimbrough is one of the original guys. And this sounds like it was recorded in someone's garage or in a pool hall or something like that. It's very reverberant. You can tell everybody's in the same room. And I, I like that kind of sense. Um, everybody's in the same room. There's tons of bleed over from one mic to another. There is no processing going on at all. It is just a natural raw, as if you were sitting at the bar in a juke joint listening to these guys play. Just beautiful in the blues. And Junior Kimbrough's guitar work is remarkable. Just a wonderful, fun album. If you're not familiar with Delta Blues, this is a good introduction to it. Um, it can be a little bit racy, some of the themes of the song, but that's typical for ju juke joint music. Anyway, highly recommended. Now, to do the big sweeping orchestral stuff, I use this recording by Seji Azawa and the Sato Keenan Orchestra. Um, it is Brahms Symphony Number no. 1 in C minor, Opus 68. Now, the interesting thing about this recording is it was recorded at Carnegie Hall in New York City. And Carnegie Hall has a real unique sonic character to it. It is not traditionally an orchestral sort of venue. I mean, you know, lots of comedians and rock bands and, and you know, all kinds of people have performed in Carnegie Hall. Um, so it's kind of a general purpose uh, facility, but... It has this unique sound when an orchestra comes in because they can't, they seat them kind of differently than the normal fan shape orchestral seating. So it's really uh, excellent. And this is a great recording. The very, it's, it, there's some very subtle quiet passages. There's mass strings, there's horns. There is just a lot of detail to be resolved. And so let's, that's a lead into resolving this. And you know what, I can, if you could help me resolve an issue, maybe give me a like and a subscribe. So sound quality on this. Again, this is my first kind of deep dive into hybrid uh, tube class D amplification. And um, I'm completely smitten with this thing. It is remarkable, the sound. Um, it is, the tubes impart a sonic character to this that is reminiscent of a tube amplifier, but not mushy or soft or slow like some tube amplifiers can be. The Class D, now with the Class D, you get the speed and the depth and the damping factor and the control of the speakers of Class D, but the tubes just take the edge off that Class D. Class D can have edge, and I have a Class D amp in the uh, Cambridge Evo 150, and that's very, very good, um, but it can have just a smidge of an edge on it. This with the tubes, man, it's just, and there's no, it's not a softening of the sound and it's not a rounding of the edges. It's just kind of a smoothing of it. There's no law. I feel like there's no loss of detail at all in any part of the frequency range, period. But there is just this, I don't know, there's a sonic character that makes it so listenable and so engaging that I, I'm serious. You can, I, and I happen to me, sit down, put something on. And then I look at my watch and five hours have gone by and I don't even feel like I've been doing anything other than just really enjoying the music. No fatigue at all, no stridency, no, 
not just beautiful, detailed, smooth. So in the base, as you would expect, Class D, this thing just rocks hard if you want it to. Um, really, really digs deep. Uh, I played some of that uh, organ music I've used in other recordings, and this went as low as you want to go, as fast as you want to get, as agile and as articulate and as textured as you could ever imagine bass could be, just like most Class D amplifiers do. But again, with that tube, just that smoothness, that, that engaging, that friendliness, that come and listen to me kind of character to it. I don't know how else to describe it. Mid bass was excellent. Attack, drum kits, perfect. Um, cymbals, great. There was no sibilance. And this unless there was a little sibilance in the recording. Um, and then this was faithful to the source, um, but not strident. One of the devices I used was that uh, Rotel DT6000, which is one of the most aggressive sounding uh, DAC CD transport pieces I've ever heard in my life. And this made it a little bit more tolerable, but it didn't sugarcoat it at all. So this will be true to your source. So again, mid bass, excellent, mid range male vocal sounded great, very good, very detailed. This amp is very agile. It's very quick to, on its feet. Um, it is, you know what, a good word for it would be, this is very confident. This amp says to you, plug me into anything you want, speakers, source, whatever, and I'll give you the best that you've heard. And it really did a great job of that. It very, very, very good. Um, very different than, uh, than a true solid state, very different than a true class D, very different than a true tube amp, but kind of a marriage of some of all of those good characteristics. There was no, uh, no sins on this thing at all. The only sin would be in its operation because the remote control really doesn't do anything and you gotta get up and do it and I'm a lazy guy. But that's it. I mean, as far as the performance of the amplifier goes, just remarkable, just excellent. So mid-range, very detailed. Agnes Oval's voice was very well rendered. Junior Kimbrough's voice was very well rendered, very natural and textured and raspy sounding, kind of that, you know, he's got a lot of road miles on him playing in all those ju juke joints in Mississippi. A lot of character in that voice. And then all the way up through the mid-range and into the upper mid-range in trouble, piano sounded natural. String sounded very natural. Horns were beautifully rendered um, all the way up into the upper frequencies. Transients, this thing is a fast amp, very quick transients. It didn't seem like there was any limitation on them. And decays were beautiful, very detailed, nuanced, textured, hung in the air for a long time, but not overly etched. I think the tubes just kind of, I don't know how to say it. It, it, it is a friendly sound up there. It's just really engaging. It you know encourages you to listen more and encourages you to listen deeper. It just encourages you to stay, just stay in your seat and run through every recording you've ever owned. It is excellent in that regard. So the, the sonic character, the characteristic of this is it's fast, it is articulate, it is agile, it is nuanced, it is detailed but not etched. It's not. It is smooth but not overly warm. Um, it's just a great combination, just a really, really good execution. I'm smitten with it, without question. Um, and again, soundstage was excellent, lock solid center, great width, great height, great depth, very, very good soundstage. Everything was just very well presented. Again, focus center. You could point to where the instruments were and kind of just draw a circle around. It wasn't laser focused, but I didn't, that's not always what I want to hear. And, uh, and sometimes the recording just can't give you that. Great depth, especially on the orchestral pieces. So just wonderful overall performance. Um, and with the Neil Blanchard Design MLTL sixes, they this thing will rock out really, really good. Um, I got I was cranking on that Junior Kimbrough album. <laughs> it sounded great. So anyway, that's the Rogue Pharaoh Two. Remarkable, highly recommended. Again, big thanks to Mike Holm and the guys at Home Audio for loaning me this piece. There will be a link to their store in the. Uh, uh, video description. Now, hopefully you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed reviewing this. Honestly, it's been a joy. Um, anyway, if you did enjoy the video, please give me a like and a subscribe. And if you wish to, you can support the channel. There's a thank you button at the bottom of the video window. And if you wish to join the channel, there is a link to do so in the pinned comment and in the video description. In the video description are affiliate links. There are no affiliate links for home audio, but there are Amazon affiliate links there for all the gear I use. And you know how those work. My playlists are in there. I'm going to be modifying some of the playlists. I've removed a couple um, because the area where I can put information in the video description on YouTube is limited to 5,000 characters. So I've kind of had to trim that out, but I'll be updating my uh, playlist 
very shortly, and I apologize for not doing it sooner. Please send me your playlist. Our Community Post has some great playlists in there. If you haven't been there, please go there, check it out. There's some wonderful music there. Comment, let me know what you think. Have you had any experience with a, high, with a hybrid solid state? Um, have you had any experience with all tube or all class D? Um, share with me your thoughts in the comments. I really enjoy the communication we have. So the Rogue Furo 2, big thumbs up. And I think that's everything. Please like, please subscribe. If you want to follow me on Instagram, please comment. I'm Ed Holmwood. This is the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. And now it's your duty, your obligation to go find some beautiful music, sit back and maybe listen to it on a really cool, really well-resolving hybrid <laughs> tube amplifier and enjoy your evening. Thanks so very much for your time. I appreciate it. Can't be beat.